I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics, www.messianicapologetics.net. If you are new to the channel, be sure to subscribe for future teachings and updates. Messianic Insider is a podcast offering you a place to discuss critical and very deep issues, which affect the future, and stability of our faith community. We thank you for your regular support and donations toward our ministry efforts. You can donate online at outreachisrael.net forward slash support. Today on Messianic Insider, questions and answers. Our question and answer episodes Follow the format of a Tanakh or Old Testament question, an Apostolic Scriptures or New Testament question, and then a Theology or Biblical Studies question. Our three topics for today, Tanakh, Book, Slash, Verse Order, Apostolic Scriptures, Book Order, Apocrypha. This week, we are commemorating the festival of Hanukkah, remembering the Maccabean revolt and the rededication of the Second Temple in the 2nd century BCE, about a century and a half before the time of Yeshua. And so with that, many of us are having to consider the historical record of the Maccabees, principally contained in 1st and 2nd Maccabees in the Apocrypha, perhaps also the histories of Josephus, and it's a natural prompt for us to, well, we're remembering something that technically isn't in the Bible. Uh, What do we do about this? Recently at my local congregation, as we were discussing Messianic theology in our new members class, the whole discussion on how we got the Bible and you know what's the difference between you know the Jewish version of the Tanakh and the Christian version of the Old Testament. This is something that anyone in today's Messianic community immediately encounters uh, when they start accessing Jewish versions of the uh, Tanakh, as well as various Messianic versions uh, circulating in our faith community. Now, we're not going to go into a huge amount of detail today uh, regarding some of the more finer nuances of Tanakh book order, Apostolic Scriptures book order, etc. Uh, but hopefully, I will give you enough things so that if you are like me and you have many versions of the Bible available at your disposal, you won't all of a sudden think, oh my goodness, they left that out. All of us need to be aware of how, whether it's the book order of the Tanakh, the book order of the apostolic scriptures, whether it's the verse order, these are all things that have been decided, I wouldn't say, entirely arbitrarily, but they come down to us from both Jewish and Christian tradition. One of the resources I have in my library that I make use of from time to time is this, the NIV Integrated Study Bible. And this tries to present a somewhat chronological approach to the composition of the Holy Scriptures. Now, that too, of course, is subject to debate, it's subject to uh, discussion. How do we know when a certain text was put together? How do we know who the author truly is? Uh, This is a a tool that uh, I tend to use more for the apostolic scriptures or New Testament, uh, given how it will have the synoptic gospels uh, put side by side. Uh, It will represent the book of Acts and, and when certain letters of Paul or certain other apostolic letters were perhaps composed in terms of the chronology of Acts, uh, it's a it's a good resource to access. But whether 
the publishers got some of the dating right or wrong, it at least indicates that do not assume that the traditional book order of the books of the Bible, whether you're using the Jewish book order or the Christian book order, that it represents a chronological order. In all likelihood, it doesn't. Uh, these things have come down to us from ancient tradition. I'm not saying that that's bad. Uh, certainly, the verse order of different books of the Bible, that is something which originated largely in the Middle Ages. Uh, certainly, when Yeshua and his first followers accessed the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, there were no chapter and verse divisions. When Paul wrote his letters to ancient congregations in the Mediterranean, there were no verse divisions or chapter divisions. People just had to read these things. And I know that for many of you as Bible readers, you recognize that. Uh, yes, chapter and verse divisions, they help us refer to things, particularly uh, when we put teachings together, when we write notes to ourselves, but they were never in the original texts of Holy Scripture. They just help us be able to refer to something much quicker. Uh, so when you read books of the Bible, it is useful sometimes to not think of the chapter and verse divisions. All right, let's get started with our first question. What do I need to know about the traditional Jewish book and verse order of the Tanakh or Old Testament? One of the things that Messianic people find out very quickly, especially if they come from non-Jewish backgrounds, is that most of today's Messianic people don't use the terminology Old Testament. It implies that the Hebrew scriptures, the scriptures of Israel, are perhaps old and outdated. Now, you will see a, a term like Hebrew scriptures or scriptures of Israel used, but you will also most frequently hear the term Tanakh used. That is an acronym for Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, or Law, Prophets, Writings. And at the close of the Gospel of Luke, after Yeshua has resurrected from the dead, what does he do? He shows people how he was to come in fulfillment of the scriptures, and it says that he showed them the scriptures from the law, prophets, and the Psalms. It is fair to say that by the time of the Messiah, that the Jewish book order of Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, law, prophets, writings, was something which was in place. And when you encounter any Jewish edition of the Holy Scriptures, whether that is a Hebrew Bible or an English translation, you're going to see that book order present. Uh, here in my library, I have a copy of the JPS Hebrew English Tanakh. And this includes the New Jewish Publication Society version in English in one column and the Hebrew in the other column. If you have a resource like this and you know, you're looking for a Hebrew Bible to use in your studies, then in all likelihood, uh, you have seen that, uh, okay, you know, I'm reading the, the, the English here, I'm reading the Hebrew there, it's pretty easy to follow, and then you're going to come across some things where the numbering order is not the same as you would necessarily see in a Christian Bible. Now, indeed, it's all the same information. Uh, most of the differences in the uh, numbering order are, you know, two or three verses, maybe even just one verse. Probably one of the biggest differences between the Jewish chapter order of the Tanakh and the traditional Christian chapter order is that in the book of Malachi, in the Jewish order, there are only three chapters, whereas in the Jewish order, there are four chapters. So those are just some things that you need to keep in mind, but it's the same information. And indeed, whether it's book order, or chapter order, verse order, these are all things that are simply traditional. 
The most important thing is that we are dealing with the information itself. Now, in terms of navigating through the verse order of the Tanakh, the Jewish verse order of the Tanakh, uh, there are two major Messianic Bible versions out there which circulate the complete Jewish Bible and the Tree of Life version. Let me re refer to you to the Tree of Life version. This does employ the Jewish book order of the Tanakh and the Jewish verse order of the Tanakh. And so in order to navigate through the Tanakh in the Tree of Life version, you simply have to be familiar with both the Jewish book order and the Jewish verse order. The complete Jewish Bible, however, while employing the Jewish book order of the Tanakh, as well as the chapter and verse order of the Tanakh, has made things a little easier in that the Christian verse order is noted in parentheses. So this is something which uh, I think, even though the translation of the Tree of Life is much better because it's more literal, the complete Jewish Bible is still a tool to be accessed at the very least because it has taken the time in a printed version to note the Jewish chapter and verse order as well as the Christian chapter and verse order. Now the customary Christian book order of the Old Testament, that is probably derived from the customary Septuagint the Greek Septuagint book order, uh, which you will see if you access the Septuagint. Uh, but indeed, it's all the same information. Uh, and I think in terms of your studies, in terms of any research you conduct, uh, what matters is that you're accessing the Holy Scriptures. Now, one of the things, uh, before I forget, that, that you also need to be aware of is most printed Hebrew Bibles Hebrew editions of the Tanakh, even if they are produced by Christian, you know, evangelical publishing houses, they are in all probability going to follow the Jewish book order of the Tanakh. Uh, and with that, the verse order of the Tanakh as well. Uh, so you can't completely get away from encountering the Jewish book or verse order of the Tanakh. And indeed, it's all the same information, but you just have to know this for your biblical studies. All right, our second question. Is it true that there is variance regarding the book order of the apostolic scriptures or New Testament? Yes, there is. Now, uh, these two Messianic Jewish Bible versions, the Complete Jewish Bible and the Tree of Life version, for the apostolic writings or New Testament, they follow the traditional Christian order. So you would see the Gospels, Acts, the Pauline letters, Hebrews, the general letters, and then the book of Revelation. But it is clear enough that when you look at ancient Christian history, that there were other book orders employed. Uh, and indeed, uh, when I was at Asbury Theological Seminary, all the way back in 2005, I remember going into the library, uh, looking at different uh, printed editions of the Greek scriptures, and I found a New Testament version from, I believe it was like 1890 or 1892, early, you know, 1890s, and it followed a more ancient or an alternative ancient uh, book order of the apostolic writings, and it placed the general epistles, those would be James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st to 3rd John, and Jude. It placed the general epistles after the book of Acts and before Paul's letter to the Romans. So it is widely recognized that one of the major alternative ancient orders of the apostolic scriptures, at least, was the general epistles appearing before the Pauline epistles. Now, there are a lot of different uh, positions out there, particularly when you get into more specialty editions of the New Testament, uh, which uh, 
you will encounter out there in the world of ideas where the translator or publisher will offer a different book order. Sometimes this is done to re re uh, reflect more of a chronological book order, and sometimes this is done for more theological reasons. One specialty edition of the New Testament that I have in my library, I've had it in my library for quite a while, is the New Testament translated by Richmond Latimer. Latimer was a, a classical Greek scholar. He did translations of Homer and various other ancient Greek plays, but he did release a specialty edition of the New Testament. This follows the traditional book order of the New Testament with one major exception. The Gospel of Mark appears first as opposed to the Gospel of Matthew. And that reflects a wide-scale theological position that the Gospel of Mark was written before the Gospel of Matthew. Now, those of you who have our ministry publication, A Survey of the Apostolic Scriptures, for the practical messianic, know that the book order of the Apostolic Scriptures represented here is eclectic. Uh, and it represents a few value judgments on my part now, let me just read through the order very, very quickly. Uh, of course, it starts out with the Gospels and Acts, but it goes Mark, because Mark was the first Gospel, and then Matthew, and then Luke, and then Acts, because Luke and Acts are Volume 1 and Volume 2 of a series, and then the Gospel of John. Following that, you see the general epistles. Uh, it's pretty much the standard order that you would see in other Bibles, with one major exception, uh, goes James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and then Jude, because 2 Peter and Jude have some kind of a relationship. Most commentaries on 2 Peter also have Jude incorporated into them. And then you have 1, 2, and 3 John. And then you have the Pauline epistles that follow the standard Pauline order, with one exception, uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then I include Philemon, because Colossians and Philemon were written at the same time. Most commentaries on Colossians also have Philemon incorporated into it. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And then finally, at the end, you have Hebrews and Revelation. But indeed, you know, the, the order of the apostolic scriptures in the New Testament, it comes down to us by ancient Christian tradition. And there were, in ancient times, divergent uh, traditions present. All right, question number three. What role do you think the, the Apocrypha, excuse me, should play in our theology? What role should the Apocrypha play in our theology? Now, this week, as we commemorate Hanukkah, or the Festival of Dedication, many of us are turning to, certainly, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, perhaps also 3rd and 4th Maccabees, we might even be turning to Josephus, for us to understand this historical event that we are remembering, the Maccabean Revolt, the rededication of the Temple. In both Judaism and Protestantism today, the books of the Apocrypha are not considered canonical scripture. They're not. Uh, so that's why if you go out and buy a Bible, they are probably not going to be included in the Bible. However, in both Jewish and evangelical biblical scholarship, the books of the Apocrypha very much are recognized as containing important history, philosophy, and commentary of Second Temple Judaism. Roman Catholics consider the books of the Apocrypha to be inspired scripture. In Anglicanism, in the Church of England, the books of the Apocrypha broadly have what would be considered a deuterocanonical status, which means you have the canon of Holy Scripture, and then immediately after it, you would have the books of the Apocrypha. One of the main reasons why Judaism does not consider these books inspired as Holy Scripture is because, well, the only record that we have today of these uh, texts is in Greek, and they are part of the Septuagint. 
And then in a lot of Protestant scholarship, you will certainly see the books of the Apocrypha referred to as, recognize, excuse me, as representing important views of the Second Temple Jewish world of Yeshua and the Apostles, uh, but it's more as history and commentary and what have you. I would have to say for myself that I'm much more in that realm of, okay, after the Holy Scriptures, the books of the Apocrypha have a place for us in our theological and biblical studies. Uh, they are not superior to Holy Scripture, but they might have a place in us reviewing particular issues, in our ongoing uh, research of different topics. It definitely provides background for many of the ideas which circulated in the world of Yeshua and the Apostles. It can't be overlooked how one of the most important books that I've had in my library since my seminary days, uh, Introduction to the Old Testament by R.K. Harrison. And by the way, the books of the Tanakh are examined in the Jewish book order in this, in this uh, resource that after the books of the Tanakh or the Old Testament are reviewed, so are the books of the Apocrypha, as it says on the cover, including a comprehensive review of Old Testament studies and a special supplement on the Apocrypha. So this at least recognizes that the books of the Apocrypha have a place in the biblical studies of evangelical believers. And of course, another resource that I've had since my seminary days, uh, because it's not just that, okay, in, for example, academic Protestantism, the books of the Apocrypha are referred to here or there uh, as a matter of one's biblical studies. There are study Bibles that, not only include the Apocrypha, but include introductions to the Apocryphal books, annotations, some kind of a running commentary, and there are commentary sets, single volume as, where, as well as multi-volume, which include commentary on the books of the Apocrypha. Uh, I use the, or I would say I mainly use the New Interpreters Study Bible. This is the New Revised Standard. Uh, this is my token liberal study Bible that I will access periodically. Uh, it, in my personal opinion, it's better than, say, the Oxford Annotated Study Bible, uh, but it includes the books of the Apocrypha. Uh, and so all of you who certainly this week are remembering Hanukkah, you need to have a Bible or two that has the books of the Apocrypha in it, and if you can find one that has annotations, an introduction, some kind of running commentary, I think you'll uh, be that much more better off. But the Apocrypha plays a role in our theology. And of course, it's not the only uh, selection of uh, extra-biblical literature that plays a role. It's one of multiple bodies of literature that plays a role. Uh, and you'll be surprised when perhaps you have to access some of this material. You know, you encounter something in the apostolic scriptures that's unclear or vague, wouldn't you know, it's very possible that in some statement appearing in the Apocrypha, that was a subject matter which was circulating around the time of Yeshua. As we prepare to close up the year 2020, we're very appreciative of those of you who have partnered with us uh, during this past year, especially given all of the uncertainties uh, which have transpired. And we would like to ask you to consider a special year-end donation or offering as we look forward to 2021 and as we ask the Lord to continue to give us the opportunity to serve him in the world and be able to broadcast every day with new teachings, new commentaries, and new frontiers to be examined. If you all found this content enjoyable and useful, please be sure to drop a thumbs up 
for this teaching. As always, we thank you for your continued support of our ministry's efforts. God bless and shalom, and we'll see you again soon. In the meantime, be sure to check us out at www.messianicapologetics.net.